So welcome everybody. So we'll start uh, in a minute uh, just to let people in. So as usual, so we really appreciate when you turn your camera on. Uh, so it's so much fun, you know, to see uh, faces. So, and as you know, so today we have uh, Filippo for the last, but at least uh, seminar of the year. Uh, so, uh, Filippo, you shared your slides and Sharon uh, Belenzon from Duke uh, will discuss the paper. Should I go on? Sure. Okay. So, uh, the floor is yours, Filippo. Perfect. Well, thank you very much for uh, accepting the paper to the seminar series. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, this is joint work with Team Cinco uh, that is here, and I'll take all the difficult questions later. And feel free to interrupt me if you have questions during the talk, and if I'm a little bit late, I'll, I'll defer them at the end. And thank you, Sharon, for taking the time to discuss the paper. So this is a, a work using census data, so usual disclosure that the paper does not represent uh, the view of the census, but only our own views uh, in, on, on the question. Uh, so the motivation of this paper is, is quite simple. <clears throat> we know that U.S. corporate sector is very important on, uh, you know, R&D. About three quarter of U.S. R&D uh, is done by, by U.S. firm. Um, now, there has been a debate and a kind of concern over the last 20 to 30 years about whether U.S. companies are maybe becoming kind of too conservative in the way they do R&D. Now, there is a lot of good research about it, some actually from uh, the discussant himself. Uh, but I think a way to kind of visualize this potential concern is that if you take total R&D, uh, which is what we do in the figure performed by U.S. corporate sector, uh, and divided between research and development, uh, which we're going to define better later, uh, essentially what you see is that, you know, development is a much bigger portion than, than, than research. Uh, and more importantly, if you look at dollar value, uh, development increase, essentially, it represents a large part of the increase in total R&D. Now, this question and other question are all related to the, to the more fundamental question, which is how do company kind of decide how much R&D to invest, but more importantly, how does the composition affect it? And the problem with this type of question is that there is, we don't have a lot of very good micro data to kind of examine this question uh, directly. Uh, and so we, you know, that's kind of a constraint to our uh, ability to kind of improve on that. So in this paper, what are we going to do? We're going to try to tackle this question, at least one aspect of this, by examining essentially how companies adjust their R&D investment when they're facing a negative financial shock. So the basic empirical setting is going to be essentially the one of the 2008 financial crisis. And we're going to essentially study company that enter in 2008 with a relatively large amount of debt due. Uh, as the, under the assumption, essentially, this company uh, will be at the margin more likely to cut R&D. And what we're going to be interested in is not only to understand whether they do cut R&D and you know, how big is this cut, but to understand how does the composition of R&D changes around these events. Uh, and the way we're going to, and the reason why we're going to be able to do this in this paper uh, is that we're going to use census data. In particular, we're going to combine data from two surveys of the census that allows not only to measure kind of total R&D at the firm level, at least for the firm in our sample, but we're going to be able to break down R&D uh, in different subcomponents. The main one in the paper we're going to discuss today is essentially research versus development, but we're also going to mention other breakdown both in this presentation and there is kind of more material, obviously, on the paper. So let me take one minute to just go through what are the main results in the paper, what is the main story, uh, and then I'm going to kind of dive in the paper per se. So to kind of set the stage for our conversation, I'm going to, we're going to start essentially by showing you that consistent with kind of a relatively simple intuition, company that enter in 2008 with a relatively large amount of, 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 of debt due relative to liquid resources, uh, they actually end up cutting R&D relatively more, okay? Now, uh, we're gonna argue this effect is large, this is mostly concentrated on a cut in 2008 that end up persisting in the short run. Uh, we're gonna then start the, the, the composition exercises. And to start, what we're gonna do is we're gonna try to answer the question, which is how do company actually materially cut R&D? And the point is that, well, a large part of this cut essentially is being achieved by firing R&D worker. So employment adjustment is really important. About two thirds of the cost decline is essentially a decline in, in labor cost. Uh, and we're directly also showing that, you know, they actually are cutting kind of R&D worker. Um, kind of consistent with the idea that R&D is a very labor intensive activity. We're gonna then essentially examine what we think is the main question here, which is how does the compositional project changes? And what I'm gonna show you there is that essentially the cutting R&D is mostly concentrated in research, both applied and basic, and development essentially stays kind of mostly unaffected. We cannot rule out that there is some small decline in development, but at the very best, this is one order of magnitude smaller than the decline in research. Uh, we think this result kind of begs two, two questions we we're gonna examine later. 
First of all, you know, why do companies essentially cut research but not development? Obviously, there is the variety of answer that 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 we can propose, and we'll come back to this later. Uh, but essentially, what we argue it's important in this context is the role of technology competition between firms. And in particular, what we're going to argue is that our results are consistent with a model in which investment in development are actually highly affected by the behavior of peers. So essentially, company invests in development to try to keep up with competitors. And that force is less important for research. In this context, if you have a temporary shock, like you know, financial shock, it's not surprising and development then does not respond as much, exactly because the company don't want to put themselves at strategic disadvantage. And you know, consistent with this story, what I'm actually going to show you is that on top of this, development will actually tend to respond to a kind of expected cut uh, from, the, from the side of competitors, exactly consistent with this idea that technology competition can be important to explain this. The second question we're going to try to answer here is at the end is like, you know, what about innovation? How does the innovation process get, get affected? And here I'm going to show you on the one end that we don't see a lot of decline in patenting. Uh, around these things, but we're going to see a big decline in quality. Uh, the way we're going to rationalize this later is with, based on the idea that this is not a kind of a uniform shock to R&D. This is mostly, as you just, I just mentioned, a shock to research, much less so than development. Uh, and so what we're going to show you later is that indeed development turned out to be much more important uh, essentially uh, to predict patenting than research. And therefore, it's not totally surprising in light of this, that when you have a shock that essentially affects mostly research and not development, patenting overalls appear to be stickier. However, that doesn't mean the innovation does not get affected. Indeed, the quality actually tend to deteriorate in, in, the, in the medium run. Okay? So this is kind of broad question, broad kind of, I think, takeaway from the paper is that you know, when we think about large shock, we need to think about the quantity of fact, obviously, but also the quality is important. In this case, we show that research can be potentially more sensitive to external shock. And this essentially has implication for, you know, the, the type of innovation output we see in the economy. Now, if we don't have any kind of question here, let me go through uh, the data, which is an important part of this design. So as I said, you know, if you use traditional data, it's kind of very hard to understand the composition of investment. You know, think about composted R&D data or, or patenting. Uh, now, what we are able to do this year is that we're going to put together two surveys of R&D that essentially the census has conducted over the last few decades. There are three important elements about this data that I want to point out. First, uh, you know, as you can see from the slide, the survey third, which is the older one, changed in births exactly around the financial crisis, which is exactly the, our time of the study. So is that a problem for us? The short answer is not, not really. Uh, and in particular, what we're going to show you, uh, you know, the, the basic reason for this is that the new survey, BERTS, is not a completely new survey, but it's essentially an extension of the old one. So for the core question insert, uh, which are the one we're going to examine today, essentially they're going to be kept kind of consistently measured across the old survey. The second point here is that, again, one important feature of the census survey, and this is common across a lot of surveys of the census, is that the sample is not essentially a panel per se, but it's a repeated cross-section. However, the probability of being uh, sample, it's not independent on size. Actually, large companies tend to be sampled a lot. And when you look at very large company in the US, in particular if R&D intensive, essentially they're gonna be sampled with almost essentially probability one. What does it imply for us is that for this large company, we can actually observe a panel of information. So we can see actually how within a company R&D changes over time. And just to be clear upfront here, uh, as it's gonna be clear later why, we're gonna actually focus on a subsample uh, of our data that match with Compustat, and we're going to look at companies that essentially surveyed it, at least both in 2007, 2008. The third and probably most important part of the data is that this survey, unlike, for instance, Compustat, does not just measure aggregate R&D measure, R measure uh, but also kind of measure the quality, the underlying composition of R&D. Um, in this particular talk, we're going to focus a lot more about the difference between development and research. So let me take a little bit to explain what are these. So the general definition of development, which is also that definition that essentially people using uh, answering this survey will see, is that development is essentially a systematic use of research and practical knowledge to produce new and significant improved goods, service, and process. Versus research, the main focus is on the creation of new knowledge. Okay? So the basic one, another way to think about this is that kind of development builds on current knowledge. So the level of technology risk is actually relatively low. Versus research is trying to build some new knowledge. And therefore, you know, we're doing things that we cannot, we did not know how to do it, in which kind of there is obviously a large technology risk involved with it. Now, another aspect when you think about research, 
is the commercial application. So another breakdown that we're going to use today is that you can categorize research in applied and basic based on whether the, the research itself is essentially uh, as a very specific commercial application. Think about the development of a vaccine uh, versus is more like kind of a broad uh, uh, a broad technology that could potentially have multiple commercial applications, but doesn't have one specific now. Okay, and to have a sense of the magnitude of these, uh, so development here is about you know three seventy percent, seventy five percent of the data uh, of of, the, of total R and D. Sorry, applied research count about twenty percent, and basic research about five percent. I think I see Camille having a question. Yeah. Yeah. Since you're talking about like the definition, so I wonder how like innovations in general, you know, fits in this framework of like uh, research and development. And, you know, especially, you know, like the Schumpeter definition in terms of product, process, marketing, or like, you know, these different types of innovation. So how, I mean, what's your view on that and how it fits there? Um, I mean, it's, it's a, I think it's a great question. I, I mean, the way we, I guess, I guess broadly defined, I would say like, you know, kind of, you know, re, the research aspect will be more close to the more uh, experimental part. I mean, the basic idea of like technology, you know, you're trying to kind of push the boundary of technology further away from what they are today. Uh, so that's kind of, I think the more traditional view on kind of disrupted innovation would probably fit in that kind of uh, setup versus development would be more like a kind of product driven, short run kind of improvement that essentially are not really kind of challenging the current status quo to some extent, but they're just trying to kind of have kind of commercial application that would fit. So more like uh, kind of incremental kind of processes. Having said that, obviously, you know, there, there is, the map is probably more, more, more complicated than this. And to some extent, I'll come back at the end with, you know, patent data that kind of will be another way to kind of maybe talk a little bit more about this. Okay. So if there are no, no other sorry, questions. Filippo, yeah. Just a, just a question. Hi, so please. the, the R&D part of the basic uh, research, that's very, that's as low as 4%. In, in aggregate, it's about 5%. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that doesn't seem like a very big part of it, right? Um, I mean, yeah, yes. I mean, in the sense, I mean, that's, this is just the aggregate data from the NSF. So I guess this is saying that, I mean, we're, these are data from the corporate sector in America. I mean, we know that a lot of basic R&D does not happen uh, in the, you know, may not happen in the corporate sector. So, so yeah, I mean, this is just a, this is just a kind of a, a statistic. So it doesn't seem like a, a, a big part of a, uh, in, at least in dollar value. I mean, it could be a big part in terms of like, you know, the actual output and the value that is created from this. Uh, yeah. but again, this is just kind of summary stuff, nothing about research design for now. Yeah, no, that's what I was kind of wondering about. Yeah. What would be the impact of it? Small changes, even large changes on this may not have that big an impact, right? Right. I mean, that's kind of the question we're going to look later. I mean, one way we're going to show you is that it, indeed, I mean, number one, we're going to find evidence both for applied and basic research. So they're not just cutting, as also I'm previewing a little bit the result, but they're going to cut both applied and basic research. So it, it is like a sufficiently large fraction. And and I get to partially going back to the question, you know, what's the impact of this? Should we care about it? I mean, we're going to show you at the end that indeed it seems to have some spillover effect or some direct effect actually on, on the innovation process by mostly impairing the quality of the output. Great. Thanks. So let me explain the, the empirical setting here, uh, kind of in a, in a nutshell. So, you know, starting this project, we were thinking about, you know, kind of given our interest, you know, how can we like shock the level, uh, the, the kind of incentive of company to do innovation in a way that then we can study, like essentially how do they adjust the overall process? And so the way we end up essentially converging is to use something that it, it's been used in various versions in, in previous work, which is essentially exploit the idea that when there is a large financial crisis, that makes it harder to refinance your debt. Uh, entering into this financial crisis with large amount of debt that it come due essentially is potentially problematic. And then the margin is going to kind of change, uh, you know, your, your cost of external finance and may incentivize company to cut uh, economic activity as a result of that. So the way specifically we're going to do it, we're going to look at the financial crisis in 08, and we're going to essentially measure how much debt is due in 08 uh, relative to a company financial resources in the previous year. So this is essentially... You know, based on the idea, the company were not perfectly explaining, uh, expecting, sorry, the way crisis. So they have a kind of pre-scheduled amount of debt that was due in 08. And if you end up in 08 with a large amount of debt due relative to liquid resources, well, the margin is going to be, uh, you know, tougher essentially to renegotiate uh, or uh, refinance part of this debt. And so you may be incentivized to essentially cut, uh, cut some of the internal investment. Okay. I'm going to come back to the identification. We have a small improvement, I think, or a significant improvement relative to the pre-existing literature, but that's kind of the, the basic idea overall. And then the, the kind of implication of this is that what we're going to do is that we're going to run a kind of a collapse difference in difference model 
where essentially we're going to have an outcome that is in changes, like in this case, is a growth of R&D between, say, 2007 and 2008, but we're going to look at other windows as well. And then what we're going to try to do is try to understand if this company that entered in 2008 with larger amount of, of debt, we're going to call them company with large refinancing need, you know, are they cutting R&D relatively more or less? Now, there are a few things about this identification I want to point it out. First and foremost, uh, we're going to always include very narrow industry effect. Obviously, what we do not want to do here is compare company in biotech to company they're making like furniture or something like that. Uh, so, you know, our baseline is going to have the narrowest version, which we can do, which is actually six digit NICs. Uh, but we're going to also experiment with like less narrow definition, making sure that essentially that's not kind of driving, to, uh, you know, our result. Uh, the other thing that this, I think, is, a, is an improvement relative to what people could have done before is that this data actually also has information about uh, the R&D expected, uh, that the company expect to do, it's kind of the company's expectation. Uh, why is that important? Because a typical problem with this approach where you use kind of pre-existing difference say, in financial structure is that obviously this pre-existing different financial structure may be impartially a function of an omitted variable called kind of firm expectation. So in this case, what could be going on here is that maybe you have a company they have large refinancing risk, but maybe they have large refinancing risk because they were already expecting to kind of cut down activity. Okay. Now, what we can do in this data is that we have information for every year, not just in the amount that the company did that year, but their expectation about the following year. So say 2007 survey, we'll have information about what the company did in 2007 and their expectation about what they're going to do in 2008. And so what we can do then, is we can kind of construct a kind of what we call projected growth which is, you know, what would a company projected about 2008 as of 2007? And kind of in an omitted variable kind of framework, we can use it as a control to make sure that what we're picking up is not difference in expectation. Now, it turned out exposed, as you'll see in the next table, it, the inclusion or exclusion doesn't make a big difference in our result, but at least exactly we thought that was a, an important adjustment. Uh, and, you know, we're going to also use deep control, you know, ideas, difference in kind of profitability, level, um, you know, size and, and R&D intensity. And then we're going to try a few other things later. Okay, so let me explain the baseline. So the baseline, we're going to start by looking at total R&D, and we're going to look at R&D growth between 2007 and 2008, okay? Uh, what do we show here? Essentially, we, this is kind of kind of building up our, uh, our empirical setting. We're going to show here, what we show here is that consistent with our initial intuition, company that had large refinancing need in 2008, uh, they end up cutting R&D in 2008 relatively more. Okay. Uh, this, the magnitude here is that one standard deviation reference need leads to about 8% reduction in the amount of, in the R&D growth over the same year. And the inclusion of our projected R&D control as well as the firm control does not significantly affect our result. Now, another concern you may have is that Maybe this company, they have large refinancing need in 2008. Maybe company that were just behaving very differently before. Could it have been they were like worse company, they end up you know, in 2008 with large refinancing need, or could it be maybe some sort of their company doing very well, that's why they borrow, and they end up essentially uh, maybe kind of reverting to the mean when a crisis happened. And so what we can do here is something kind of similar to kind of in a, in a, in a non-collapse definitive, in a, in a level definitive, in kind of the, the pre-trend analysis, which is we can kind of replicate our specification over time and kind of see if what we're picking up here are difference in, in kind of pre-existing growth between different companies. And so if you look at this figure in 2007, 2008, just to be clear here, the outcome are measured kind of as rolling growth uh, over the, the, um, uh, the year in the, in, the, in the graph and the year before. Uh, what you see is essentially that company that entered in 2008 with large referencing, they actually did not appear to have differential growth before. And actually in the, in the new version that we have in the paper, we can go all the way back to 2002 and essentially you see the same result. Now, the other important aspect on this figure, on top of just showing also that, you know, over in this panel version, our main result in 2008 is, is very similar, is to look at what happened after. And in particular here, to look in what happened between 2008 and 2009. And here, what we see is essentially a null effect. Okay. What does the null effect mean? Does it mean that company essentially had the perfect reversion back to the, to the pre-level shock? The answer is no. Again, this is like a, 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 the specification kind of where the outcome is a rolling growth. So what this is telling you is that company that cut in 2008 because they were shocked, uh, they did not continue cutting in 2009, but also they did not increase relatively more in 2009 to kind of compensate the, uh, the activity that they've cut in 2008. And so this is suggesting that you know, what the 2008 result is not simply company moving resources from a project that was supposed to be done in 2008, say November, and now it's done in February of 2009, okay? And in the paper, we do a little bit of an extension down, and essentially what you see is that over time, company tried to catch up, but the story there is a bit more mixed 
uh, on whether it is a full catch up or not. But for sure, again, at least in the short run, there is some persistence. Now there is a bunch of kind of robust tests. I'll come back to these if there are questions or if, uh, later. Uh, but let me so now kind of what we show so far is that you know there is a, a contraction in R and D in response to you know reference a company that kind of contracted and relatively more in two thousand eight. Uh, and then the question is how do they do it? So the next thing we want to look is exactly you know what kind of margin the company adjusted the most. And so what we're going to do next is essentially what we can measure in the survey is that we can decompose R and D uh, in this cost component. So we can look at wage, kind of investment, kind of material cost, and other cost, and kind of try to understand what exactly uh, the company, you know, what exactly do they cut in response to the shock in order to achieve a reduction in R&D. And so what do you see here? And the specification is the same as before. What we're just changing is the outcome, that instead of being a kind of growth in total R&D, now it's a growth on, say, the wage component of R&D. Uh, what you see here is that, well, on the one end, companies are cutting kind of a little bit of everything. You know, you see essentially throughout the spectrum that, you know, they, they're, most of these items essentially are declining. However, a separate question is, you know, in terms of size, which one is the most important? And this is a combination of both the direct effect that we estimate in this table and the kind of pre-existing difference in the importance of the different cost. So when you do some sort of simple back of the envelope, essentially what you see is that about two thirds of the overall reduction uh, is essentially due to a reduction in labor cost. And this is, you know, as I said, this is in a way to be expected, uh, if this is a real cut in R&D, because indeed R&D is very, you know, kind of labor intensive, about 55% of the cost is, uh, is, is, is wages. Now, what you may be worried here is that, is this maybe just a change in kind of the wages, like a company maybe just cut wages or cut bonuses in 2008? The answer is that not entirely, at least not, it doesn't look like that from the data. And the reason is that what we can also show separately, and we have in the paper, is that you see the fine same result when you actually look at the number of R&D work. So companies are actually effectively cutting R&D worker, and that is why at the end, or at least one of the main reasons why they're going to cut kind of labor cost. So bottom line here, you know, again, company is cutting R&D, the main marginal adjustment seems to be kind of labor cost, uh, and, you know, about two thirds of it. The other question is, what about the composition of R&D? So what we do next is essentially run, uh, again, our same baseline specification, but now we're going to look separately at the growth in research and development. And so what you see here is that most of the decline is really a cut in research. Development essentially, uh, you know, seems to be relatively stable. Hey, you know, you find pretty large effect on research, as you can see here, like relatively, uh, you know, highly significant and, and relatively large in size. When you look at development, again, the coefficient is negative. So we cannot really rule out maybe there is a small decline, but even in the best interpretation uh, in magnitude, this is kind of one order of magnitude smaller than the decline in research. So what this is saying is that the, the shock was not kind of neutral towards the allocation of resources. Uh, company cut R&D, but actually what they did, they cut almost entirely research, kept development roughly constant. Nico, now, you have two questions in the chat. So Navin, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? So Filippo, I, I was just wondering, so when you let go of a lot of uh, the researchers in 2008, and then to come back to the same level of growth in 2009, are you able to hire all of those back or what exactly is going on in that particular case? Yeah, I mean, ex in a way that's kind of ex exactly why we think the result kind of makes sense. So you're, this is kind of what we've shown before. The shock as you know, non-persistent effect on growth, but essentially has a persistent effect on level. So what's going on here is that the R&D scale declined. So they cut R&D in 2008, uh, but it does not grow back to the 2007 level later. Exactly because what they're doing, they're firing out in the worker and rehiring back these people, it probably take time and cost. And so they're not going to be able to go back to the pre-shock level right away. So maybe I wasn't clear on, on the, so, but essentially that's exactly what we think is going on here is that the shock has kind of a persistent effect. I mean, partially be essentially because it kind of affect this margin that is kind of really hard to adjust. And in a way, that's why we think it's interesting relative to say, if the cost was just a reduction in material cost that obviously they're very easy to kind of adjust up and down. Oh, okay. So the point I was asking, the reason I was asking is that because it's going to be so, so much harder to rehire these researchers, it's quite possible that they are not firing as many people as they would otherwise do. So you may be actually underestimating what might be going on. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. I mean, that, that for sure is something that may be going on here at the margin. For Yeah. Thanks. Um, so... Let me see a time. Are you doing time? Uh, yeah, so I should be fine. So there are two kind of questions that kind of follow from this, at least that we thought that were interested. 
I'm going to present them in the opposite order we do in the paper, but I think it's easier for the presentation. Uh, the first one is essentially why. You know, why did they cut research, didn't cut development? Obviously, this is a very complicated question. So, you know, there's probably not one, one answer. Uh, but, you know, let's try to see if we can learn something more about this uh, in, 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 in the talk. Uh, so the main things that usually people come up with, in particular, when I present in a finance venue is, well, what this is going on here is that maybe this has to do with the duration of the different type of investment. Like research is longer term, has longer duration. So, you know, you may prefer to cut research than development uh, just because development will impact your revenue next year. Research may impact your revenue kind of down the road, a few years down the road. Now, one interesting aspect here is that if this is just about duration, then we should learn something by comparing applied research to basic research, okay? Those are the two components of the research item. The reason is that essentially the same argument you can make of research versus development, you can make it within research. Applied research by you know, itself is essentially you know, much more shorter duration than basic research. And we don't have very hard to get exact evidence of the difference duration, but essentially the same argument kind of should apply there. So therefore it's what company are doing is simply, we're gonna sort all the project based on duration. We're gonna cut the one that are longer term. What we should find is that the elasticity we estimated should be larger for basic, uh, or maybe completely entirely by basic relative to research, okay? Is that what we see in the data? The answer seems to be not really. So what we do here again, same specification, just the outcome now will be basic research in column one and three and applied research in column two and four, again, with the same kind of uh, growth rate uh, outcome that we discussed before. Um, and so what you see here is that you see an effect on both. So company are cutting both basic research and applied research. Um, and if anything, the magnitude is in the same ballpark, but if anything, it's a bit larger in applied research. Okay? Again, this seems at least uh, you know, kind of inconsistent that what's simply going on here is that they're just going to cut the very long duration project. Uh, again, this would, uh, would kind of have a, kind of the opposite prediction, at least directionally. Now, you can build a kind of a single, a similar argument regarding risk. Like, again, basic research should have much more technology risk than applied research. So if all they're doing is cutting the very kind of risky stuff from a technology standpoint, again, you should see uh, that basic research is dominating rather than applied research. Uh, but that's, again, not what we find. Now, what could be, this is not to say that duration and risk don't matter. Obviously, they could matter as reason why applied, uh, sorry, research and development are different. But what we're trying to argue is that this is not the simple story that is going on here. Uh, and so another hypothesis that we came in which this could be kind of uh, related is essentially this idea that maybe this has to do in part with the fact that development tend to be a very important kind of strategic uh, competitive variable for company in the short run. And the same may not be true for research. We tend to be longer term and maybe less motivated by just keeping up with competitors. So why is this story relevant? Well, because if what's going on is that here is that development, it's mostly about kind of keeping up with the competitors. That is not totally as surprising that when you face the shock, you may not cut development immediately, or at least you may not cut it to full extent, because what you're really concerned is that that's going to put you in kind of strategic disadvantage relative to competitors. So essentially, this competition will make development stick here. Now, obviously, that could be one model, but how can we know that this is what's going on here? Well, one way to which uh, we can test it is essentially look at another implication of this simple model, which is if this is really about development being more influenced by competition, then we should find evidence of this. We should find evidence that development investment are actually affected by the behavior, or at least the expected behavior of competitors. So how can we test this? So the way we're going to do it is kind of simple. Uh, which is to say, on top of having our own kind of firm-specific measure of exposure to the shock, what we're going to try to construct is a measure of kind of exposure to the shock of a firm competitors. So this is essentially the basic idea that, you know, you're going to behave differently here uh, if essentially you face a large shock. Uh, and potentially you're going to be also influenced by the fact that maybe you know that a lot of your competitors are also in kind of in trouble this year, and therefore they're more likely to uh, kind of, you know, you know, not being as aggressive in competition in the short run. So from the measurement standpoint, the way we do it is essentially we have each firm as a special, as a measure of treatment, as, a, you know, our refinancing need in 2008. And for each pair in the data, we can construct a, me a measure of, of technological proximity using patent data, essentially following Bloom and co-author. And then we can construct for every firm in the sample, essentially, what is the kind of average uh, treatment for firms that are technologically close? So just to make an example here that is not necessarily an example in our data, which is kind of a random example out there, uh, if you have a company, say General Motors, uh, and you have a specific firm shock, but you're also going to have 
you know, how much refinancing need company that were technologically close to General Motors had in the same year. Okay. And so you're going to have these both measure. And the interesting thing is that now you can kind of use them in a horse race, which is you can try to understand how important is the first specific shock versus the shock to competitors. And so that's what we do here. So if we focus on column one, here what we're looking is overall R&D. So we're looking at the initial outcome. And what you see here is that kind of consistently with what we showed before, if you face a, a larger financial risk in 2008, you're going to cut R&D more. That's the first row. But what's interesting is that, well, if your competitor are also not doing very well, they also have high refinancing that year, you're going to cut even more. And this is kind of consistent with the idea that, you know, in this context, uh, you know, you're going to feel more comfortable cutting R&D if you know that essentially everyone is, is also potentially in trouble. Now, our story was a little bit more nuanced than this. It's in the sense that it was really trying to show that this is about development rather than research, meaning that strategic interaction and competition is more important for development than research. And that's kind of what we show in column two and three, which is in column two, we look at research and essentially the strategic variable doesn't matter much. Uh, in column three, we look at development. And what we see here is that actually the expected behavior of competitors, that's a one way to import it, or essentially the exposure to the shock of competitor turn out to actually much more important than the first specific shock. So what this is again suggesting is that strategic interaction seems to be important. And in particular for development, that seems to be kind of more important than the first specific shock uh, in explaining the changing in, in investment. And this is kind of consistent with, with, the, with the idea that, you know, potentially the reason why we don't see much response is development is that development is essentially influenced much more by the strategic kind of competitive forces that kind of force company to keep it more stable in the short run. Now, the second and last thing that I wanted to, you know, kind of, uh, I wanted to talk about uh, is, is what happened to the innovation output, right? That can kind of relate to some of the question I got earlier. Uh, the reason why we think this is interesting is essentially, you know, uh, for, for multiple reasons, you know, more importantly, because this is kind of an unclear scenario. I mean, you have at least a baseline situation that what maybe is going on here is that, well, company experienced this negative shock. We know company are not always either optimal. So maybe they're going to use the crisis to just cut out all the low quality project that maybe have a very low MPV or maybe even negative MPV. So if that's the case, then we shouldn't see anything on the output. Maybe, you know, maybe it could even improve in some, in some, in some, in some scenarios. Now, the other aspect that makes it like tricky here is that kind of going back to some of the earlier question is that we actually don't even know very well what is the production function of patenting, right? It's not totally clear if patenting is about kind of, you know, it's patenting much more about kind of, you know, taking the input of research or is much more essentially uh, about kind of following up and investment in development. Now, one way to kind of look at, and, and this is clearly important for us. Uh, why? Because our shock is not a uniform shock. Right? As we saw before, our shock is mostly about research. It's not about development. So to the extent there is a symmetry there, well, well that's going to play out a role. Uh, we can actually explore the issue of, of, you know, is this patenting more about research or development uh, in, in the following table? Just to be clear here, this is not the same specification. This is purely descriptive evidence. There is no identification here. What we're trying to do here is essentially doing the following. Uh, you can think about the outcome being patenting a firm level in ERT. And what we're trying to do is explain patenting at ERT with research in T minus one or development in T minus one or both. And every specification will always include the lag of patenting as well as kind of industry by year fixed effect. So what he was trying to do is it's simply predictive exercise. Is patenting today more about the past research or the past development? And so what you see here is two things. Number one, well, it's about both. Like both research and development, they're positively affecting patenting, which is kind of makes sense. And I think it was kind of, you know, what we were hoping and uh, to find here, at least as a baseline. However, we have a, less, a much less kind of clear prediction exactly about whether it's about research and development. What you see here is that the magnitude of the effect is about twice as large for development than for research. Okay. So what this is suggesting is that, again, you know, what you see in the data is that kind of development investment seems to be much more tied to kind of patenting behavior than research, at least in the short run. Okay. Uh, now, and this is again, not totally surprising for some scholar in particular, uh, maybe, uh, you know, in management, essentially where essentially a lot of maybe the patenting idea that may be more related to kind of the, the final product that a company developed rather than the kind of more general research idea. Uh, and that obviously is going to be important potentially, because as we said, our shock is more about research, is much more about research than development. And the last point obviously is that we don't know also because quantity and quality are different and obviously too, they both could be affected. Okay. So let's just look about what happened here. So what I'm doing next essentially is looking at total patenting. Just to be very clear, I'm using the same specification as before, 
uh, uh, with a little difference, which is in column one, I'm doing exactly the same, okay? Where the outcome is gonna be now the growth, the symmetric growth in patenting between 2007 and 2008. Now in column two and three, I change it a little bit. Why? Because essentially I create a post period that now include patenting all the way to 2010 and all the way to 2012. The basic reason why is that obviously patenting may or maybe actually should respond with the lag. So maybe there is nothing right away, but it could be stuff down the road. And so what do you see here is that, you know, again, using the same specification as before, you seem not to find much on patenting. Again, the coefficients are turning negative over a few years. Uh, but again, even in the best kind of more uh, kind of uh, less conservative kind of interpretation to suggest that, you know, patenting may have been kind of stable or maybe kind of declined, but just very small decline. Now, when you look at, uh, you know, quality of the output, instead, the story is a little bit different, okay? So here we do, again, exactly, exactly the same as I discussed before, but instead of looking at the count of patent, we now look at the citation, okay? And what you see here is that, well, immediately there is a not that much. Again, we think that makes sense. Again, we, would, we think about this almost as a placebo to some degree. We don't expect the quality to change immediately as the shock happened in, in, at the same time. But when you look at quality over time, you see some deterioration. So again, this result seems to be consistent with the evidence we've seen before, which is like, right, this is not a uniform shock. You're affecting R&D, but you're pretty much mostly affecting research, much less so development. And so essentially, to the extent that patenting are really proxying that later part of the R&D process, then it's not totally surprising that total patenting may not change that much. Uh, but again, that doesn't mean that essentially the quality of the input, uh, the, the output is, is unchanging. And that's what we kind of see here, that there seems to be some deterioration in, in the innovation output. Uh, now that you have like three, four minutes left. Yeah, so I was about to conclude. So I have plenty of time. I can uh, do a, uh, you know, actually more, more than necessary. So what we try to do in this paper is essentially try to understand how company adjust the composition of R&D uh, in face of a large negative event. Uh, what we show here is in 2008, company characterized by large referencing risk, they end up actually um, reducing in R&D investments significantly. This contraction happened uh, mostly in research, both applied and basic, and uh, essentially development was largely unaffected or at least uh, very minorly affected. And in, um, in terms of, you know, a company achieved this mostly by firing essentially R&D worker, uh, which represent about, you know, in the labor cut essentially represent about two thirds of the adjustment. What do we think are the key takeaway of the paper? Um, number one, I think, you know, this is kind of making the, the point that can, can be true also outside R&D, which is, you know, when you think about like kind of shocks, uh, to financing, or it could be other nature, uh, you know, it's important to think about the, both the size of the effect, but also kind of the direction, you know, how does the composition changes? And what we're showing with this paper is that in, within R&D, actually, what we seem to see in 2008 is that research was actually more sensitive than development. And, and that could have implication, as we show at the end, on the kind of path of innovation going forward. And what we also try to make the point is that, you know, potentially strategic or competitive consideration could be important in explaining difference in response. Uh, and so, and that's that's kind of what, what we were saying before. So that's it. I am glad I was on time. And uh, thank you very much for your attention and looking forward for uh, the uh, discussion and comments. Thank you very much, Filippo. And the discussion is Sharon uh, Belenza. So can you thank slide? you, Camille. Yep. Uh, can you hear me OK? Yep. And uh, can you see my slides? Yes. Okay, great. So uh, thank you. Uh, I need my glasses. All right. So thank you very much uh, for inviting me to discuss this paper um, and uh, really excellent paper by uh, Filippo and, and Tim. So it was a really a great pleasure to read the paper and think about the issues. Uh, so what I'm going to do, I'll try to kind of give you my thoughts about the agenda um, and kind of some main comments about the paper and hopefully can leave space and, and time for many of us to uh, discuss. I'm sure you have many questions. So I'll tell you what I find interesting. I'm not in the same field as you in terms of finance. So I'll give, I'll give you maybe a different perspective. Um, so what is this paper about? As you just saw, uh, Filippo did a, a great job describing it. So I'm just going to do kind of tell you what I understand, which is I think quite obvious now. Uh, what is the effect of financial pressure on corporate research and development? Uh, I think this is like the general kind of research question. And uh, looking at the financial crisis uh, of 2008 as the essentially empirical context. Um, so the basic argument, as I understand it, is that as external financing becomes more expensive, uh, 
R should be more affected than D because R takes longer uh, to materialize, more uncertain, et cetera. So it should be more sensitive uh, to changes in the cost of capital. I'm going to kind of talk about this a bit in my, in my comments, uh, but this is, I think, the main, one of the key arguments. Um, what is really cool about this paper, and really like, I think this is the main, main contribution for somebody like me, is the use of new data uh, from, census, from census on R versus D. Uh, this is amazing in my view. I always wanted to do it myself and I never got a chance. And I just think this is brilliant and the authors should be congratulated for really pushing the, the research in this space uh, forward. Uh, and the reason is usually like, as I will show you in the field, in this field, including finance, as well as economics and strategy. And we typically use kind of outcome measures or more indicators like uh, publications, uh, patenting, how many scientists work in the firm. We didn't have access to this level of kind of dollar amounts. And this is a great way to move kind of the literature forward and revisit some of the questions that we've been asking with different measures. Um, so, uh, the, as, as I mentioned, so the basic, basic idea is you use 2007 level of liquidity or like need for capital uh, position of the firm with, with controls uh, and use that as your treatment, as a treated group, and then see once the financial crisis hits, uh, compare the behavior of those firms in terms of investments in R&D to, to the control. And what, they, what the authors find, I think quite convincingly, is that firms with uh, higher exposure to the shock uh, cut R but not D, uh, unless the rivals are also exposed to the shock, and then we see the D also changes, so indicating that there is some kind of strategic uh, complementarity uh, uh, in, in the profit uh, in, in the profit function. I would say uh, in, in D. Um, what is also really interesting, and this is the last thing that uh, we saw in the presentation, is that the long-term patent quality decreases, which is a really important result uh, in my view. So why should we care? Uh, so this is why, actually, why I care. Everybody should care for different reasons. I care because one of the overarching questions I've been studying for, like, you know, since I started my academic career, I think, was trying to understand why firms invest in scientific research and why, why should we care about whether firms invest in scientific research? I'm not going to talk about it now, I'm just telling you why I think it's important. This paper contributes to that, to that agenda by emphasizing institutional determinants, uh, which I have not studied. And in my kind of, in like more strategy economics field, we haven't studied a lot, but in finance, this is, I think, a growing literature, clearly focusing on financial frictions, financial pressure, as well as investor activism, which I'm going to touch on in a few minutes. Uh, and then the other part, which is kind of closer to my stuff, but I think, I think it's really relevant here, uh, like the authors did not talk about it, but I think maybe it's interesting to think about is the organizational determinants and specifically who pays for R&D uh, within the organization, uh, central versus uh, business units versus headquarters, big issue like uh, Google Brain and other things. This has been a key issue there. Uh, the independence and autonomy of corporate research units and the commercial pressure corporate researchers face, how all of that influences decisions uh, to invest. And I think all of it essentially is linked to financing and, who we and, 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 and where we think the dollar amount is coming from. Uh, the next kind of thing, which I think is really important, if I have time, I'll show you a few, a few slides, is femetrogeneity. Uh, you know, we typically tend to think about changes in research and development within corporations as a homogeneous phenomena. It is not. We all know that the Googles of the world and Microsoft and others have been investing heavily uh, in, in, in scientific research, while others have been cutting back. And I think this paper can potentially help us understand uh, some of the antecedents of this heterogeneity. Access to capital can be a one of them, size, uh, distance from the frontier is something which also worthwhile thinking about specifically as you kind of formalize the relationship between research and development. Uh, I think you can do a lot to kind of uh, to uh, add to our understanding of how the composition of research and development have changed over time. Now you have data which we did not have. So this is great to, to kind of try to, uh, to enrich the literature. And then, you know, one of the biggest questions for me is who pays for scientific research? Uh, the government, uh, VCs, I don't think so, unlikely. Uh, the government, definitely, yes. 
public markets, like you suggest, I'm going to challenge this view, or internal capital markets, which I think is a right is a right kind of answer. In my view, the government and internal cash. This is usually how we pay for these really really expensive and uh, and lucrative uh, investments. Um, so, what are the summary of my main comments? I'm sorry, uh, Camille. How much time do I have? Uh, I, I just I, I... Uh, you have ten minutes left. Ten minutes. Oh, I guess I can. I'll do it quickly. Um, so, so the, this is a kind of summary of my comments. <clears throat> Uh, so the first thing is, you do have non-survey indicators. It would be interesting to see uh, what we see there as well. Uh, and here the kind of literature is mixed. And, and this here I kind of look at two main two papers, which I, I know from my colleagues here at Duke, that looked at like patenting and publications. Uh, they didn't use financial pressure uh, like you did. They actually you look at activism, uh, but it's the same logic of financial pressure, I would say, and uh, not the same logic, but both look at finance. Um, so one of one kind of uh, a really nice paper by Alon Brav and his co-authors actually find an increase in patenting, although a reduction in R&D, arguing that essentially what financial pressure does is pushing for more efficiency. Uh, and efficiency in this case means cutting back on R&D like you find, but actually patenting more, which is not really what you found. So I think it's really interesting to try to link to that literature. And then there is a work in progress by my, co by my colleagues here in the accounting department, uh, Fracotti and, uh, and Vashista. Sorry, I should, I should delete it, Raul. Uh, Elia Fracotti and Raul Vashista. Um, we actually replicate, not replicate, but build on, on, on this paper by Alon and just look at research like you did. They don't have data, rich data like you, but they do find actually a reduction in publication, which is consistent with what you find. And I think trying to kind of really understand what is happening, what is going on, uh, is really cool. And I'll tell you some of the thoughts I have. Um, so what does liquidity capture? Should you kind of talked about it. I'm not very convinced that liquidity is a right measure. If you want something more exogenous, I would just use size. Firm size, you know, smaller versus larger firms. This is something I can understand more in terms of being kind of something which is, more, which is less endogenous at a given point in time. <clears throat> So this is kind of my, my main kind of thinking. And I talk to my friends in finance and to understand how people think about this in different, in different fields. And this, I think, is something that maybe require more thought if you want to talk to a broader audience um, that may not agree to the same assumptions uh, that you make. Uh, so the, I think the basic argument is that uh, more hazard and asymmetric information uh, means that it's really hard to finance innovation by going to external markets. Clearly, we have VCs, etc. So the argument here is that our the research side suffers more from these kind of problems, um, which means that external financing is not the best, it's not the most likely uh, source of funding for research. And if this is true, then why do we care? about frictions in external markets if we don't really use external markets to finance innovation. Um, so another thing which I want to point out is that the vast majority of research is performed by big firms, by big corporations who have lots of cash. And those firms are unlikely to be exposed uh, to, to the shock that you have. Uh, so maybe it kind of touches on Avin's point uh, from before, what are you identifying from? Um, I'm kind of a big fan these days of kind of maybe taking a different view of the dark side of internal capital markets, maybe emphasizing kind of that part, uh, why financial pressure may actually drive firms to uh, eliminate uh, activities that may be not profitable. And I'll, I'm going to kind of give you an example a bit later. Um, another, another kind of comment which I think is important is uh, you distinguish mostly between R&D in terms of the time horizon. Uh, actually, papers that we wrote and others, and clearly the, the big literature in economics that, that think of, thinks about scientific research, uh, they typically think about scientific research as potentially being an input into D, not necessarily, but not thinking about these two activities in the same way in terms of their ability to impact profits. Uh, more, at least the way I think about it in our papers, D is an invention function. This is what, drive, what drives profitability. R is an input into invention. And if this is true, then we just, it would be nice to kind of maybe frame it a bit differently. And the last thing I would say about this kind of uh, comment is the Great Recession also was a huge shock to demand. And if you believe that uh, the research 
is, is financed mostly through internal cash generated by own products, um, then, then this is going to be a different, then maybe what is happening is not a shock to, to, the, to, to kind of the cost of capital, but actually to the ability to finance uh, and research and this kind of expensive lucrative uh, investments with a declining stream of profits of, or this declining stream of cash flow. Um, I think it's really interesting. The last point is that you do find a reduction in present quality, which is consistent with the idea that research is actually an input. And once you cut back on research, you're going to see these outcomes uh, later on. So um, our research just gave you a sense. We find overall a decline in research over time. And what is important to note is that the, research, the decline has stagnated. So right now it's about 20% of business R&D uh, is essentially research, both applied and basic. So we don't see a decline anymore. Uh, it stopped in the past 10 years was roughly stable. Um, this is when you, when you look at Salve, uh, if, so this is like the aggregate version of your, of your data, looking at Salve's Salve of research and development funded and, and performed by, by businesses. And, and you typically find, I think, similar evidence that you, that you, that you have at the, at the firm level, a reduction over time from close to 40% in the late 50s to about 20% today. But over the past 10 decade, or over the past decade, uh, we, got, we, we were a bit um, kind of stopped, uh, kind of stable at 20. Lots of heterogeneity across industries. I hope you can maybe look into that as well. But I think what may be the most interesting part for me as a strategy kind of scholar is trying to understand the heterogeneity in the decision of firms to invest in research. And typically here you see clearly the decline of at and the breakup of Bell Labs, et cetera, but you see a Microsoft Alphabet right, performing more research over time while others cutting back, IBM staying stable, um, and many other big firms don't do any, any research. Uh, so I think you can talk to that to some extent. And if you look at today, maybe the last two examples I'm going to give you, look at um, like the cool stuff that is happening today on AI and quantum, this is, a, this is example, an example of two emerging fields where highly capitalized companies invest in, research, in scientific research. A big chunk of the advancement in, in, in research in this field comes from, the, from, from, from farms, uh, from big farms. Those farms are very big, have lots of cash. And I would be shocked if there is any evidence suggesting that they pay for these investments with money coming from the outside. And this is a key thing. Uh, for, for I think for you guys to think about on the link. I'm not saying there is no link. I just think the, I just think the link between external capital or, or financial pressure and, and research is a bit more complicated. So just some kind of MBA, fun MBA slides. I'm going to skip this stuff because we don't have time, but this is what we teach our MBA students. Financing innovation with external funds is hard. Clearly we have VCs that kind of address some of the issues, but why is it hard? because you don't have any tangible assets. And then you have asymmetric information, uh, which is obvious. And you have more hazard uh, in, the sense, in the sense that when there is success, uh, the you know, innovator gets a return, they're kind of the rewards, the bank or the, the bank gets, uh, just get the, ret the returns, but loses everything. If, if there is a failure, this is why we have VCs, equity funding and all this stuff. This is just kind of some fun slides, which I have for the MBAs. But I go back to kind of uh, the more serious stuff. Um, yeah, I don't th I think left, Sharon, sorry to interrupt. How, how much do I have? Uh, two minutes. Two minutes. Okay, so I'm going to do it quickly. So this logic about, you know, why external fund funding is not going to work leads to the essentially conclusion, in my view, that science, that science scientific research is funded uh, through internal capital uh, markets. And, and here I'd like to point out in the time I have is maybe what we have seen, what we are uncovering is the dark side of internal capital markets. We have these really expensive legacy investments. In this case, you see DuPont, for instance, like from like 100 years ago, extremely expensive uh, and just funded by internal capital without oversight or with all this kind of other consideration coming in place. And what we need is people like Nelson Peltz to come in and say, you know what, this doesn't make any sense. I want you to cut back on this, on this activity because maybe today we can get the science from other places. It's much more efficient, much cheaper. Uh, and this is what we essentially potentially see. And I think this is the kind of the logic behind Alon Brav's point. And here you can talk about, we can talk for hours about, you know, is it like the dark side of external capital markets or the dark side of internal capital markets? But in my opinion, the link of financial pressure, the link between financial pressure and innovation can be exemplified in this kind of DuPont. By the way, DuPont, this is a DuPont research lab completely shut down 2016 by, by Nassau Peltz. 
um, because of the arguments that you that some of you mentioned. Nothing here is it's not about the cost of capital. It's simply about legacy investments. We don't want it too expensive. Let's get rid of it and get what we need from startups and from universities and just focus on what we are good at, which is developing uh, chemi chemical co compounds, production, marketing, et cetera. So hopefully I gave you some ideas to think about. And, uh, and again, I want to congratulate you on really pushing this literature forward. And I hope you know, we can have more kind of, uh, kind of deeper conversations between different fields that really examine these important, uh, I think, important questions. Thank you very much.